Hello, everyone. I think we'll get started. Um, great to see everyone on a Department of Medicine Research Day. I always look forward to this. I've been on my second one, and it's been uh, wonderful so far. We've had part one, today's part two. But I have the honor of actually um, announcing a new program that we have in the Department of Medicine. It's an R38 STAR program. It's a resident research program, and it's uh, sponsored by the NIH, in this case, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And it allows protected time during residency for those residents who want to continue investigation or begin investigation. There's no need for a prior PhD. And it's for those folks who might have a little, they think they might have the research bug or interested in a career investigation, in investigation, would like to get started. And so we were just awarded that. And we have two R38 scholars I'd like to tell you about. The first one is Dr. Oliver Van Oakwen, who's sitting right there and uh, who uh, grew up in Belgium and, and completed his medical uh, degree at KU Leuven University, was very drawn to uh, data analysis, um, bioinformatics, transcriptomics data, but then actually ended up doing a, um, I was a graduate student in the lab of Samir Parekh, and became very interested in CAR T cell therapy, specifically to target melanoma. And, uh, and I think that is the area of investigation he's particularly interested in, and will be applying for uh, HEMOC uh, fellowships uh, actually this summer. So we're really excited that you're part of this program. Um, we hope that it'll help you uh, jumpstart your, uh, your pathway to uh, become a physician scientist. So thank you. And our second candidate, um, uh, Dr. Johnny Nicholas, couldn't be with us. He's up in the CCU rounding right now. So I'm going to have to find out who that fellow in the attendings are that didn't let him out. But um, nevertheless, we uh, are, will, will definitely want to make sure he's um, honored as well. And he received his MD degree from the American University of Beirut and uh, pursued a postdoc fellowship at the Center for Interventional Cardiovascular Research and Clinical Trials right here at Icon School of Medicine, and works with Dr. Roxana Moran and George Dankus. And so his, um, his main um, interest is in the area of complex data analysis outcomes within the field of interventional cardiology. And so he aspires to be a physician scientist and clinical trialist. So we have got two amazing scholars. We actually have another R38 grant that's being reviewed through a different institute. And so if that uh, uh, comes through, we'll have additional spots for more residents interested in investigation. So really important way to keep up the physician scientist uh, pipeline, which is so important, I think, to, uh, to what we do. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Kraft, for that really exciting announcement. Um, I have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Murdoch P. Riley for the Burson Yellow Memorial Lectureship. The Burson Yellow Memorial Lectureship is awarded to the physician scientist and researcher who embodies the extraordinary investigative spirit and self selflessness of its namesakes, Dr. Solomon Bursow and Dr. Rosalind Yallo. The award began in 1980 as the Solomon A. Burson Lecture in recognition of his groundbreaking work in biochemistry and his years of dedication to Mount Sinai Hospital. In collaboration with Dr. Rosalind Yallo, Dr. Burson helped develop an a number of groundbreaking antigen assays for various hormones, including insulin, parathyroid hormone, ACTH, and growth hormones. Their work formed the foundation of modern nuclear medicine. In 2022, the department renamed the award the Burson Yallo Memorial Lectureship in recognition of Dr. Yallo's equally significant contributions. It should be noted that neither scientist patented these processes nor profited commercially from their medical and scientific breakthroughs. Dr. Burson later served as the chair of the Department of Medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital from 1968 to 1972. In 1977, after Dr. Burson's passing, Dr. Yallo received the Nobel Prize for their joint work. Um, so Dr. Murdoch P. Riley, he received his medical degree from the University College Dublin, Ireland, and completed his residency and fellowship training in medicine and cardiovascular medicine at the University of Pennsylvania where he also received a master's of science degree in clinical and genetic epidemiology. Dr. Riley is the Herbert and Florence Irving Professor of Medicine and Vice Dean for Clinical and Translational Research at the Vagalos College of Physicians and Surgeons at Columbia University. He is also the director of the Irving Institute for Clinical and Translational Research and PI of Columbia University's NIH funded Clinical and Translational Science Award. Dr. Riley also serves as the director of the Cardiometabolic Precision Medicine Program in the Division of Cardiology at Columbia University. His research program is dedicated to transla translational and precision medicine studies of human atherosclerosis and heart disease, as well as inflammatory mechanisms of cardiometabolic disease, 
emphasizing humans as the most ideal model to understand mechanisms of and therapeutic opportunities for human disease and prevention. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Riley for the Bersignalo Grand Rounds. Um, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure and a privilege to be here today and honored um, to give this lectureship. I want to thank the chief residents as a group, because I think seven of them are some large number that, that uh, impressed me because I didn't realize there were so many distinct hospital systems that were covered by the full residency program. Emily and, and the Department of Medicine team, Monica, and, and uh, everybody who was involved in my invitation. And I really <clears throat> do think that the Burson uh, Yala lecture it has a touch point for me because I believe that in the late 80s through the 90s, I probably performed more RIAs than I'd uh, like to account uh, for as part of clinical translation research around metabolic and cardiovascular uh, epidemiological types of studies, as well as actually cell-based studies that I was working on at the time. Um, and that really ties into kind of early career development, wherever you are in the world, and we've had a number of candidates coming through that we've heard about, Oliver and Emily, who came from different backgrounds also. The key part for me, I think, throughout my career was mentorship, senior mentorship, near peer mentorship, and, and then peer mentorship. And it's still very important, uh, even when you get to a senior level, to, to have mentorship and, and peers that you can really discuss things with. Um, I did my master's degree at Penn, partly to plug into the systems around mentorship, but it wasn't so much the master's, although that did give me a lot of um, uh, particularly around genetics, a lot of knowledge and a lot of um, collaborations, but it was around the mentorship structures that made a big difference. And I'll come back to that a little bit during the lecture. Um, so, you know, atherosclerosis is a systemic disease and we deal with it every day. And one person is missing who's in the CCU right now because they're probably dealing with some patients with atherosclerosis. And it remains the leading cause of death and disability. And its clinical consequences are, you know, our coronary, coronary cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, peripheral vascular disease, and other manifestations also. So very systemic disease involved in a lot of different types of manifestations and a very common disease process. And, and despite LDL-lowering therapy, which has been a huge uh, impact on outcomes, you know, uh, residual cardiovascular risk after LDL-lowering remains the major cause of death in our elderly populations and our population overall. So we have not really conquered cardiovascular disease despite our LDL-lowering. We've delayed, we've slowed, we've mitigated, but we're still seeing people die of cardiovascular disease more so than any other disease after LDL is lowered. So What's going on there? What's the opportunity? What's the gap? And again, if you go back over, you know, let's say 70, 80 years, what is atherosclerosis? Um, and essentially over that time, there was competing hypothesis by decade almost of it's a mechanical disease. It's a lipoprotein disease. It's an oxidation disease. It's an inflammatory disease. It's a smooth muscle cell disease that's come up a number of times. It's a thrombotic disorder. And it's now a somatic mutation cancer-like disease with clonal hematopoiesis. So, you know, which one of these things is it? And the reality is, is it's really all of these things. It's a very complex disease, and it's the complex interplay over a life course that really controls and manifests the disease. So many of these elements are involved, uh, mechanisms are involved at different points of the disease or in combination. And this is a classic model for how a lot of the basic mechanisms and progression of atherosclerosis, and you'll find that in hyperlipidemia or in the presence of diabetes with vascular inflammation, or smoking or hypertension, you get endothelial activation, you get diapedesis of LDL into the intimal space, you get recruitment, attachment of monocytes to the endothelium, and their movement in the intimal space, and then uptake of lipid, gradual proliferation of these cells, expansion of these cells, foam cell formation. At the same time, smooth muscle cells respond to this attack on the blood vessel wall like a fibrotic cell, like a, a cell that's trying to respond to injury, and they migrate into the lesion and populate the lesion in an attempt to heal or form a scar, and they form the fibrous cap. And I'll talk a lot more about that in a few minutes. So my perspective for this particular um, um, presentation and lecture is that you know, residual cardiovascular risk, despite LA lowering, is a major cause of death and disability. So we have a big gap, remaining gap, in how we manage patients, particularly patients with known disease who are elderly, right? Uh, genetic studies have identified over 300 loci for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. I'll talk a little bit about that. 
the causal genes at these loci remain largely undetermined. So even though we've done a bunch of work in the last 20 years, we really don't know what is the gene at a locus that causes the atherosclerosis when we find a genetic association signal. It infers causality, but we don't know what the causal gene is, we don't know what the mechanism. A large percentage of those loci have no relationships to traditional risk factors. So you can screen all the loci across other genetic data sets, and we don't see that they're associated with hypertension, lipids, et cetera, et cetera, obesity. So what's going on with that? They're not the traditional pathways that we've been thinking about. They're at the vessel wall, more than likely, or in the immune system. And what we found is, in, in, in a number of other groups found in the last decade, is that there's enrichment <clears throat> at the GWAS loci for genes that are expressed in smooth muscle cells or that have heavy expression in smooth muscle cells or regulation in smooth muscle cells. So that actually pivoted the field back, the smooth muscle hypothesis of atherosclerosis, like, which had been kind of ignored to a large extent for 20 or 30 years. Smooth muscle cells were focused on for stent uh, restenosis mechanisms, but were, were not as, as, as studied in, in terms of atherosclerosis for 20 or 30 years, in the last 20 or 30 years. And recent work from our lab, but particularly Gary Owens and Tom Quaternbus' groups, have really shown that smooth muscle cells specifically are involved in modulating atherosclerosis, particularly plaque stability features, the fibrotic cap, and the features that relate to whether a plaque would be unstable or stable and cause clinical events. And I will note that there are no FDA-approved therapies in any form of trials that target smooth muscle cells, and there are no actually FDA therapies that are approved for unmet needs of residual cardiovascular risk. So there's a big therapeutic gap here and opportunity as well. <clears throat> so, you know, atherosclerosis and coronary heart disease and cardiovascular diseases are complex genetic diseases, but it's just worth remembering they're familiar. And that's one of the reasons we, we know that they have a genetic basis. We also know it's a very complex one. But in that context, it really doesn't matter what age you are. If one of your siblings or family members dies young from heart disease, your risk goes up. So if you're if you're age 65 and somebody dies in your family this week, your risk is higher than it was if they didn't die. And it's stronger when the event is younger, but it's, it's true right throughout life. So, and that's after correcting for all known risk factors that have a genetic basis, lipids, hypertension, et cetera. So the genetic risk is there beyond what we know about the genetics of risk factors. And that's, that's kind of the underpinning of an approach to looking for genes for atherosclerosis that we've, we've uh, pursued over the last 15 years or so. So of what we have found, I'm just going to summarize briefly again, more than 300 loci um, that have genome-wide significance. It's overwhelming, and it kind of gets a little bit diffuse, a little bit like, what do you do with that? And people have gone out one after, uh, one, one at a time after. But, but it's worth kind of clumping them or grouping them or bucketing them at some level to help understand what's going on. Less than half of these are known loci that have genes for risk factors, for known risk factors. So they're not really working through hypertension and lipids and obesity and diabetes. Most of them have unresolved mechanisms, but you can bucket them into genes or loci that have genes that are more expressed in smooth muscle cells, endothelial cells, immune cells. And you certainly see these patterns across these cell types. Maybe less in immune cells than we have hypothesized from all the mouse work in the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, maybe more in smooth muscle cells and endothelial cells than we'd expected, certainly in smooth muscle cells. Uh, also, we find that there are many pathways that have been enriched. And I'll come back to that in one of the aspects that I'm talking about later. Um, uh, surprisingly, using germline genetics like genotypes and sequencing for cardiovascular disease, when you take that data, you can actually identify somatic mutations through informatic approaches and human genetic uh, algorithms. And that led to the identification that uh, uh, there was these somatic mutations that occurred in the blood cell lineages that were not germline. And these were, have been associated with increased cardiovascular risk, uh, particularly with aging. And anybody over the age of 70, and I'm moving there rapidly myself, will realize that about 10% of the population, maybe higher, has clonal hepatopoiesis, which are clones in your blood, in myeloid cells, and other cells circulating. And mostly it means nothing except it does increase risk of atherosclerosis and much more likely you'll die of cardiovascular disease than get cancer, which is a longer risk for clonal myelopoiesis. So it's, 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 like, um, it's like insulin resistance pre-diabetes. The risk for heart disease is actually probably higher than it is for actual diabetes complications over the lifespan. So we took the approach that instead of going after genetics of known risk factors, which would inform obviously new genes for heart disease, all the lipid gene discoveries, which are very exciting and still remain very exciting, APOC3 is an example, 
that as a cardiologist, we could get angiographic data and cath lab data. Let's go to where we had our action going on. So we'd study angiographic phenotypes and hard phenotypes for the actual disease itself, case control studies. Harder to do, a bit more bias and challenges with it, but we did large studies over time in this area. And in starting in 2011, after about four or five, five or six years of work with GWASs, we published a, a couple of papers in this area, and we identified, interestingly, two genes at that time. One was for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease manifestations, also related to MI. The other was just related to MI, MI uh, the ABO blood group. I won't talk about ABO further, but I'm happy to chat about it with anyone at any time. Very interesting story. But Adam TS7 is one I'll talk a little bit about because it works through the smooth muscle cells, probably, or at least we think. Platinum TS7 is a big metalloprotease enzymes. It has, you know, as far as we know, very few substrates. We don't even know what the substrates actually are still, despite unbiased proteomic profiling in the, in the vessel wall of mouse and human. It does cleave some proteins that we know that are expressed in blood vessel wall. Um, and one paper had shown in, in the late aughts of 2000 that there was a phenotype in vascular smooth muscle cells. But when we identified it as a locus of coronary disease, we went ahead and made a knockout mouse, which is what a lot of people do. And I'd evolved to do lab studies after my clinical training, uh, particularly under the mentorship of Gareth Fitzgerald and Dan Rader, colleagues at Penn. And we found that in response to vascular injury, for example, showing very extremely here, is that you really blocked the response to vascular injury. And this is where you wire injury a carotid artery in a mouse model or a rat model. And it seems to block this. And this is predominantly a smooth muscle cell matrix response to vascular injury, like a stent or an angioplasty. So it seems to be involved in modulating um, the vascular response at the smooth muscle cell matrix level. Does it block atherosclerosis in the mouse model? Yes, it does. If you knock out this gene in mice, you block the development largely of atherosclerosis. This is true in APOE mouse model. It's also true in LEL receptor mouse models. And we've done a lot of work over time in other groups of reproduce this work and have shown that it's dependent on the catalytic activity of Adam TS7. Now, despite that, and just a very quick summary of like much work that's out there and unshown and much work that's unpublished, Adam TS7 is a novel gene for human CAD of one of the 300 loci that's out there, right? One at a time approach. Um, it's slow, burdensome work. It's expressed in arterial smooth muscles and endothelial cells. Global loss of function in mouse model is protective, suggesting that inhibition of this protein might be a protective way, a drug for this might protect against atherosclerosis. However, because of the complexity of the human genome, this is one of the 2% areas of the genome where, in fact, sequencing does not resolve the locus for mutations because it's got multiple pseudogenes there. And that is not resolvable by short read sequencing. So we need long range, long read sequencing, which is really not done at scale yet. So we don't know if mutations knockout mutations in humans, loss of function mutations in humans protect against coronary disease, and we still don't have that data. It's like you'd say, well, you don't have that, you don't have that data. It's part of the 2% of the genome that's not fully resolved. And then, of course, there's confusion in, in, in EQTL studies, which is showing that the expression of the gene relates to a SNP, that SNP relates to disease. Well, it shows that overexpression, the SNP that's associated with higher expression in, in, in vascular tissue seems to be protective. And that's really the opposite of the mouse model. So this is a confusing area, and it turns out to be more confusing because the EQTLs have one direction in vascular tissue, another direction in adipose. So there's very much a tissue cell-specific function of this gene that we really don't fully have a handle on. So what remains to be determined 10 years after the discovery of this locus and the gene with multiple groups working on it, whether it's a target for therapeutic interventions and work pursuing further, and there are many groups and industries still working on this area. But not to depress you about that, because I'm still very excited about this. Rob Bauer, a colleague of mine, has a bunch of work and papers coming out in a grant um, working on trying to resolve some of these questions. I do think it's an important area for therapeutic considerations and mechanistic understandings. We were very excited that the smooth muscle cell focus was leading to discovery. So we really backed off and said, well, look, let's try and understand a little bit more about smooth muscle cells. And as I transitioned to Columbia in 2015, technology had advanced to the level of single cell technology has been applicable in these areas, as well as lineage tracing in mice. So we actually said, look, we know that smooth muscle cells in response to vascular injury, wire injury, and an atherosclerosis migrate into the intimate and change their phenotype. That's well established from the 60s, 70s, 80s. But we don't really know what's going on with those cells. We don't know how many or what type, what their function is, et cetera. So let's map them now with modern technologies. So we asked the question, what cell types are derived? How are they changing? Can you modulate this? And Hui Pan, who's now just started as assistant professorship at Vanderbilt, led this work over a period of five years. 
And so basically you take a mouse model, and in this case, you've got a ZS screen tag on the MYH11 um, um, gene. So you've got a, uh, the promoter, so you're tracking what is a canonical smoothness cell marker. And what that means is that this will always show green. These cells will always show green if the origin was smooth muscle cell. It's like your passport. You go into any country, the passport states where you were born. You can't hide it, basically, if it's on your passport. So the passport here is that it's green if it was a smooth muscle cell, even if it completely changes during its life course to some other kind of cell. And you can see in the bottom here, that happens in atherosclerosis as the lesion builds up. You can see the red-green cells here are fibrous cap cells expressing MYH11 and the green, but most of the green cells in the intima in the lesion itself have lost all of the smoothness cell markers. They've changed, and there are a very large proportion of cells in the lesion. So the result in this case initially was that a, a very large proportion, over half of the cells in any lesion, are smoothness cell derived, much more than we had actually thought before. And they turn into cells that don't look like smooth muscle cells. So we compared, we say compared with our, our, our Chen Yar bioinformatician. A group of cells, these cells are what we call intermediate cells because they were green smooth muscle derived cells, but they had no smooth muscle cell markers. Here's the smooth muscle cells, a different cluster of cells, but they're all green in this area, including these other areas. And we compare these to smooth muscle cells. And they turn out to have a lot of fibrotic genes, inflammatory genes, but also a series of stem cell endothelial and um, monocyte gene expressions, uh, myelin cell gene expressions. So they're not actually a mesenchymal stem cell, but they're stem cell-like in their features and they're proliferative, and they're this intermediate cell. And over a series of in vitro and, ex and in vivo studies, we found that this cell population could be pushed forward to fiber, fiber chondrocyte type cells, or it could be pushed forward to foam cell, more macrophage-like cells, or it could be forced backwards towards the smoothness cell phenotype. So a very plastic populous cell in the lesion. So what does that mean? These, these cells are very plastic, they're proliferative, and they could be targets for you know, what's going on, genetic regulation and therapeutic intervention. So we performed with single cell data a, a, a master regulatory analysis. And I just like to show this because it's fun to show this, but all it means is that we were able to take all of the gene expression differences between smooth muscle cells and these smooth muscle derived cells and compare based on gene expression, what were the regulators that would regulate the gene expression differences? And we came up with a number of things that we expected, like TGF betas and NF kappa B, all known to be involved in atherosclerosis. But we lit up a, a master regulator around retinoic acid signaling, crab BPB2. And this actually lit up particularly around some of the genes that were markers for that intermediate cell population. And of course, I said, oh, this is very exciting. We've never seen this before. I'll go back to the literature. And people have been studying this in the 60s and the 70s and 80s in smooth muscle cells, but never really got beyond observational uh, uh, studies and some early studies in rabbits and rats. Um, but the bottom line is retinoic acid does modulate smooth muscle cell phenotype. We want to do a study with a clinical drug, ATRA, which is used from promyelocytic leukemias, that activates uh, retinoic acid signaling. And when you activate retinoic acid signaling, you reduce the size of the lesions in atherosclerosis you reduce the number of these intermediate stem cell-like cells that arrive from smooth cells, and you increase the fibers cap, um, and you, <clears throat> you overall reduce the number of smooth cells in the lesion. So overall, it suggests that when you use retinoic acid in this situation, you're pushing these cells to healing cells, fibrotic cells, and away from these other cells that are perhaps more inflammatory and foam-like cells in the lesion. And that's consistent with a number of groups, works, Gary Owens and Tom Coturmus in particular, who've shown other regulators that will switch, reduce the amount of these intermediate cells or switch them to be more fibrotic and healing or less fibrotic and healing. The TCF21 involved in fibrosis and KLF4 with Gary Owens involved in actually more inflammatory and lesion disturbing or inst lesion instability genes. However, despite that, we don't really understand what regulates the smooth muscle cells transitions what the transitional cells are doing and how these cells are behaving and what they're actually doing in the lesions or what they're doing in micro domains, which I'm not talking about today, but spatial mapping of these cells is quite important in my mind. So we took two approaches to this over the last number of years, a human discovery driven approach, which gets me back to human genetics and an idea that I want to share with you, which is kind of a cool one, I think, it excites me still after 30, 40 years of doing this type of stuff. Um, so we wanted to use human genetics to try and identify genes that were expressed in smooth muscle cells that were causal, and then prove that causality, and also study what the effect of loss of function of those would be. This was led by, by Tom, is led by Tom uh, Mawson, um, who's a, an MD uh, doing two years in the lab, and he's returning to clinic soon. He's writing up this work as we speak. 
least I hope he is. Um, but Tom is a great cardiology fellow, and he worked um, on a Sarnoff Fellowship, which is an, a, a, one of the approaches, again, for taking Tom out in medical school to get experiences, and, and it had a pivotal effect on him working with Peter Libby, and, and again, great mentorship. Um, so this is an idea that I'll to just, in human genetics, that if you can identify human knockouts, which is like a mouse, the gene is knocked out, loss of function in the gene, that that human or groups of human can inform what the effect of blocking that gene protein would be. So we know this is a very powerful way for identifying drug development because PCSK9 blockers for, ather for lip lipoproteins were developed this way. Identify the gene for high cholesterol, for low cholesterol. Is it gain of function? Is it loss of function? Understand a bit more about it. Develop an antibody, block the protein. You lower L the L cholesterol by 80%, and it's a super, super drug for for people who don't tolerate statins or who need more lowering, for example, FH patients. And APOC3 therapeutics is another example of lipoprotein discoveries, human knockouts, and going from human knockouts to therapeutic development and phase three trials that are ongoing for APOC3 and triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. So predicted loss of functions or loss of functions, which are like variants that cause premature stops, right? That is a prediction, but that's pretty much gonna be a loss of function, um, are, are, are known um, to cause loss of function in express protein, but they're very rare. Right, to have a, a loss of function mutation is a very rare event. We see it in our Mendelian disorder clinics, but the population, these are rare things. Um, so we find it hard to collect enough people with a loss of function. So how do we go about that? Well, one way we go about that is finding populations like Ashkenazi who have intramarriage at a high level and founder effects, and you have more of these um, genetic favorability for finding loss of functions in recessive traits. Um, we've been working with Pakistani Genomic Resource because I've known Dinesh Salahin, who have built this resource for over 15 years and published extensively together in genetic epidemiology. He's born in Pakistan, did his training in Cambridge and then the U.S. and is the Columbia faculty, but is based in uh, Pakistan, building this resource mostly. Now, Pakistan is interesting because of cultural and religious religions, 40% of marriages are first cousin marriages. <clears throat> That's the highest proportion in the world. Other countries like Bangladesh and Saudi Arabia are pretty high as well, but it's Muslim and cultural and, and, and familial, if you will. Um, but it does give very high consanguinity in the population. So after um, a number of sequencing in, these, um, in, the, in this population, it uh, wasn't that high uh, up in the 20,000 range. One human knockout for over 5,000 genes was identified. You'd require probably tenfold higher outbred Western populations who didn't have intermarriage at that level to find this. Now, Pakistan is a population of uh, 220 million, and that's pretty big. And their goal here is to recruit a population, a subpopulation, a subsample of 1 million, which should provide a discovery of one human knockout or more for every gene in the, or every protein coding gene in the human genome. So you can do a mouse knockout project at a human scale eventually in this resource. It would take about 10 million people to do the same study in the West, basically. So that's why we go after this, and we've already worked with Dinesh, and there's over 200,000 200, people already recruited, exomes and whole genome sequencing, and 100,000, and therefore we have a lot of data that we can work with, and I'll show you how we use that in an interesting way. The hypothesis overall in this project is that if we integrate human population studies with lineage tracing in mice, and then go to human knockouts, we can really pin down discovery, tissue, cell specificity, and then human phenotyping, all in kind of a series of events. So what we're doing right now for further functional genomics, for the top candidates that come from this, we're doing a lot of work in mouse model cell studies, but we're also recalling large cohorts of families with the predicted knockout in the population from the exome sequencing. Um, so this project looks a little bit like this. We start with a large GWAS project. We didn't repeat the GWAS project because the Million Veterans Project did so last year and published a paper with a very large population. We just took the data, filtered it from um, 16, 17,000 genes at 300 loci. We filtered it a little bit to come in a bit closer on the loci at uh, plus or minus a megabase. And then we had this critical step of getting rid of all genes known to be associated with risk factors, particularly lipoproteins. So we just got rid of any loci that had any association with any of the risk factors. We're not interested in that right now. We're just interested in things that are vessel wall associated. So it enriched for things that the vessel wall got rid of kind of intermediate or medi mediating risk factors. Uh, this could be vascular cells, endothelial cells, we both cells, myeloid cells, immune cells, but it was enriching for that. And then we actually took our mouse data and human published data for large sets of sequencing, RNA sequencing, and smooth muscle cells, 
with genetics to show high levels of expression, regulated expression, EQTL expression, which is just snip related to expression of spoonful cells, and took our single cell fate map data that I showed you already, the green cells, and looked at high gene expression there, combined those, overlapped at these loci and filtered further. And this is an example, I think, from human carotid plaques, and there's a paper that's just been published in ATBB, where we profiled a series of carotid, human carotid plaques with seq which is single cell seq and protein seq. Uh, protein profile at the same time. And you can see all the different clusters of cells in the human atherosclerotic plaques. And of those, these are the smooth muscle cells, smooth muscle derived cells, and endothelial cells. And a particular gene we're interested in PD3A turns out to be expressed predominantly in smooth muscle cells, smooth muscle derived cells. And that's an example of how we integrate the mouse data and the human data, et cetera. Um, we also then go back and we take exome data. If you um, uh, find um, a large data set that has exomes, which allow you to ident identify, as I say, predicted loss of function. You can look for association studies. You could say, MI cases, controls, is there enrichment for the loss of function in the cases of the controls? And that's a very strong causal signal, much stronger than GWAS, which is really more of an association signal that doesn't point to the gene. But if you have loss of function in a gene at a locus, that's, and it's associated at statistical rigor reproducibly with the disease, that's kind of accepted as causality. And also directionality, loss of function is good or bad. It's like PCSK9, again, which direction is the effect? So we were able to do that, but right now we only have about 20,000 case controls in the exomes at scale. We'll have 80,000 by the midsummer, and that's where we're going to improve this data set a lot. But we filtered by the evidence that some of the genes had exome signals as causal signals. And then we made sure that there was a, we went back and made sure there was enough expression in vascular tissue when we went to GTEx or StarNet data, which is based here, for example. Um, we can look at, say, that th these genes are expressed in tissues that have smooth muscle cells, and that's what we're interested in. They're not highly expressed in a bunch of other cells because that would kind of lead us astray a little bit in our interpretations. And the last was we had to kind of make sure that there was enough predicted loss of functions in these genes in the Pakistani population. So at 80,000 exomes, is there more than five people who have predicted loss of functions, they become probands, and then you recruit the families. So we five allows us enough leeway to think that we will actually identify families in the Pakistani cohort, because they're very responsive to getting involved in studies. Here's a typical family tree. There's a lot of, of, of very close families that live together in very extended families in the cities and in villages. I've just been there literally last week, and it's like, it's amazing to see some of these village structures where basically everybody's related over several hundred years. Um, and this is a large pedigree, but it's a typical pedigree. The green lines here are first cousin marriages. You know, count the number of first cousin marriages within this large extended pedigree. So this is an opportunity for this particular gene that we're interested in to identify homozygous knockouts from heterozygous probands that we identify. So there's many families like this, but we needed a few of these families to be able to rec recall and, and do the studies. Now, from the screening and before the recall, we ended up with like the top 15 or so genes I'm showing here. And I'm just showing the top 15, and it's a preliminary study, as I said, the exome tests were not were underpowered, and we, we're adding to that now. But the first top, the, the top three or four things were things we expected. These were genes we had already found, people already knew, and Adam TS7 is in there, for example. The next three are kind of exciting because people had not been focused on these, but PDE3A is, is a target for salostazole for peripheral arterial disease claudication but nobody had ever studied it for coronary disease risk as a causal gene. So that was kind of back in, in the game with a drug already in clinic. Now, maybe not the best drug because you get a reflex tachycardia on that drug, but there's a lot of work that could be done there. And then down here was a series of genes, two of which have Mendelian forms of vasculopathies, incredible rare forms of disease have mapped to these genes, both um, Moya Moya and carousel, carousel type phenotypes. So again, all of this is pointing, oh yeah, my God, that these genes are smooth muscle expressed, they're at loci for coronary disease, and they're kind of making sense, and we haven't been working on them. So at this point, we're working on PD3A, HGIPL1, both in mouse models, cell studies, and recall studies in Pakistan. We've already, uh, for both of these genes, recalled over 300 members across about five or six families for PD3A and seven or eight families for HGIPL1. And we phenotype them for you know, multiple phenotypes around the cardiovascular trait side with carotid IMTs, coronary calcification by age, vascular history, and then safety. Because the main thing that the drug industry is interested in is if you target this with an inhibitor, which could be like a heterozygous loss of function, what does it look like on safety information? Liver, kidney, 
systemic metabolic and endocrine profiles. So that is one of the reasons that this population has massive investment from pharma to screen drug targets for efficacy, but also the safety side, because how many drugs get killed along the way because when you use the drug in humans, they have side effects. You can predict that from human genetics. You can totally predict what a drug will look like um, by a heterozygous knockout, usually, because it'll give you a sense of what that drug would do systemically, which we often don't know. Um, so that's ongoing work in that area. But you know that's only on the human side, and humans are the best model in my mind to keep working with, but you want to use complementary models. And again, that lineage tracing in mice allows us to know that these are smooth muscle cells. And we, can't, we don't have the technology yet to define in a lesion a cell that was derived from smooth muscle cells 100%. We have a number of tricks there, epigenetic marks and some antibody profiling close to the time we do, but it's not perfect. So going back to Huizé's work after the initial paper where he found these intermediate cells that have some proliferative and stem-like features, um, we discussed the idea, well, what does that mean? So we decided to dig in a little deeper and Huizé is a very creative investigator and a lot of this work was his ideas and I'm delighted to see him launch his career at Vanderbilt, which I think is a wonderful environment for a young investigator. So a couple of observations published was that there's a lot of evidence of DNA damage in atherosclerotic lesions, human and mouse. And a lot of that is oxidized DNA damage, which is derived from, <coughs> which is derived from the hypercholesterolemia, oxidized LDL, and then that causes oxidized DNA damage, but also diabetes causes oxidized DNA damage. So there's a lot of base excision rare pair pathways, DNA damage pathways that are activated, they're downstream of oxidized DNA damage. And it is enriched in macrophages, but it's also highly enriched in smooth muscle cells and smooth muscle types of derived cells. And a number of groups have shown that. We, we reestablished that paradigm with our fate mapping to see that the oxidized and DNA damage was occurring in green cells that had changed from being smooth muscle cells. The second observation is that when you use these confetti mice, which is looking at multiple markers by color, like we just use green, but you can use multiple markers by color to map a population, let's say, of smooth muscle cells. And if you get clonal expansion, you know, you've got a green color and then you just see the green expand. You don't see yellow, red, or white expand. And if you don't have clonal expansion, everything is proliferating. But in this case, there's several groups over the last five, six, seven years that have shown clonal expansion of smooth muscle cells in the diseased intima of atherosclerosis as well as in aneurysms, which comes back to this idea of clonal smooth muscle cell expansion from the media into the intima. Now, when you think of DNA damage and DNA oxidative damage, this decision repair, and then clonality. What does it make you think of? Oh, my or flipped over there. But it makes you think of tumors, right? It makes you think of cancer, right? You've got, um, you've got um, um, clonal expansion, and you've got DNA damage going on. And that's a very kind of canonical it's paradigm for tumors. Now, it's not like this idea was new. Again, I thought some of this idea is, you know, great. Or smart or coming up with new ideas but like back 20 30 years ago there was people who really were looking at this now they didn't have the technology and they didn't really have a lot of the mechanistic tools um, to advance the questions but there was a significant amount of work done but it was mostly observation um, and published in reviews particularly by Jeffrey Ross and Jeffrey Ginsburg um, uh, at that time largely dropped after that and even with the clonal hematopoiesis myeloid cell role in athro we weren't really returning to this in our thinking because we got focused on so many other things, particularly with the human genetics on the germline. So what we did was we used our single cell data and we looked at normal smooth muscle cells in mice in the media versus smooth muscle derived cells versus smooth muscle derived cells that were proliferative versus the smooth muscle derived fiber cells. And essentially you can map through the single cell RNA sequencing, predict C and copy number variations, which are gain of copy or loss of comp copy in a region of the genome. So we could see this, that was occurring a lot more copy number variations, either loss or gain of functions were occurring as disease progressed in these smooth cell derived cell populations. Uh, we they weren't unique to those actually, as it turns out, which is kind of interesting. And when we took human plaques, and we've done this maybe 15 or 20 human plaques now, and again, you use healthy vascular tissue from uh, an autopsy specimen from someone who died young, and we had and we have the RNA sequencing of that. Again, predicting copy number variations, we would predict uh, extensive copy number variations, expansions in smooth cell derived cells and, and cells that look like the smooth cell derived cells in the human lesions. And interestingly, these copy number variations overlapped genes that were enriched at GWAS loci for coronary disease 
and enriched in cancer pathways. So here's some examples in this particular patient. Here's a bunch of, in black, CAD-associated loci genes and a red cancer-associated genes that had CNVs occurring in the atherosclerotic vascular tissue in the human carotid plaque. KRAS I'll mention here because I'll come back to it. Now, when you took these cells that are the green mouse lesion cells, I said my flow cytometry because they have markers of that proliferative type, LY6C, LY6A, you pull out these green kind of proliferative cells and study them ex vivo, they actually are like immortalized cells. They are more proliferative at baseline compared to smooth cells. Smooth cells do not proliferate very much after passage 10. And at passage 50, these still are growing and expanding. So they're almost like an immortalized cell line when you take them out from in vivo. There's many other features we studied, but um, we were able to identify that they would form spheroids. And spheroids under certain media conditions are very typical of tumor cell-like behaviors and they don't typically occur in non-tumoric cells. So these smoothness and drive cells that were proliferative, taken out of mouse lesions could form these spheroids that were proliferative, they had other features, and they in fact expressed multiple uh, cancer stem-like cell markers on their cell surface. In addition, when we looked at canonical, well-accepted cancer pathway gene activation using a a program called Progeny, which is focused on cancer pathways in RNA sequencing data, we could see that almost all of the cancer pathways we examined were turned on in these intermediate cells, except for one, which turned out to be TGF-beta, which is kind of a modulatory pathway for smooth muscle cells to differentiate them, it turns out. And the bottom line, we validated most of these pathways at Western blotting and traditional, traditional cell biology tools. So, that could all be just association, right? You got a lot of stuff going on in the lesion, you're smoking, high cholesterol, diabetes, you just get all this damage occurring and it's nothing to do with mechanism and causality, it's association, it's kind of confounding. So we said, well, let's test the hypothesis as best we can. So we took the approach of saying, can we introduce a mutation in the mouse model in the smooth cells alone that would accelerate DNA damage and tumorigenicity and see if that affected atherosclerosis? Um, so we picked KRAS as a mutant that we wanted to study, the G12D, which is a, a known mutation in human tumors. We picked it because it's common in cancers. It activates DNA damage pathways. It activated three out of the several pathways that were activated in our data. And it had turned up at the CNV profiling that we'd done as one of the genes that had copy number variation increases. And so when we introduced this mutation into smooth muscle cells in the mouse models, we got a marked acceleration in DNA damage, a marked acceleration in green cells in the lesion and a marked acceleration in the lesion size. So at any one time point, eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, if you looked at the mutational uh, analysis, these had accelerated very rapidly the development and increase in the smoother cell populations and in smoother cell derived populations and the lesion size. So if you introduce a mutation, the call is mutation, somatic mutation into smooth muscle cells, it's pro in a mouse model, right? We don't know if that's true in human, and there's a number of groups globally who are seeking to sequence plaques to look for KRAS mutations and other mutations, not in the myeloid cells or in the blood-derived cells, but in the endothelial cells, the fibroblasts, and particularly the smooth muscle cells. That has yet to be proved, but the CNVs have been proved in our work. So we decided to take the opposite approach, and we took a clinically approved therapy, which is a PARP inhibitor, which is basically blocking DNA repair and induces cell death in tumors through apoptosis predominantly. It does affect other pathways like proliferation. And we tested the hypothesis of what would happen if we used this. We expected that it would kill off these intermediate cells by stopping DNA damage repair, which is occurring in these cells that somehow escape, um, that are able to escape proliferate. And we thought we'd see a lot of apoptosis, but we certainly were interested in what would the effect on lesions. So it reduces the lesion size, reduces the necrotic core, increase the fibers cap. So again, the therapy seemed to shift to a more stable plaque. And it seemed to do so not mostly by apoptosis, but by reducing proliferation and the, the cells that derived into those intermediate cells. We're still not sure of the actual mechanisms for that. But the bottom line is, is that, um, summarizing this section, is that the phenotype switch smooths to derived cells in atherosclerosis have marked amounts of DNA damage they're proliferative, they have genomic instability, and they have multiple tumor-like features and behaviors. They're not metastatic cells. They're more like a benign tumor cell, a myeloma, uh, um, not a lyomyo or sarcoma, but more like a lyomyoma, if you will, um, because they don't invade outside the blood vessel wall that we know of. Um, smoothness cell-restricted oncogenic mutations increase smooth cell phenotype switching and accelerate atherosclerosis. So if you get a mutation in a mouse model, 
you can make a gangbusters atherosclerosis model. Um, it turns out you need lipids to be elevated to get that. We've tested that. Um, clinical therapies for cancer that block DNA damage repair reduce atherosclerosis in the mouse model. So this sets up a paradigm shift in our mechanistic and therapeutic considerations because it switches our thinking towards some of the paradigms for tumors and cancers towards atherosclerosis. And that's true for clonal hematopoiesis. We've been thinking about targeting antibody therapies towards IL-1 beta activation and other clonal hematopoiesis targets in patients who have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, particularly elderly patients. But this, I think, it sets up a new area of thinking about, is there a general activation of tumorigenic pathways? I think there is. Does that mean there's a generalized approach with therapeutics that are more on the uh, tumor-like behavior and paradigms that we could be using more broadly? Um, that's a big open question. Obviously, adverse effects is a big area there. The other is, is that if we profile vascular atherosclerotic tissue from patients, are we going to find somatic mutations and CNVs that are specific in their type for that human? And then we would pick a, a KRAS therapy and there are KRSG12 mutation therapies specifically already in cancer that we could be thinking about. So this is precision medicine oncology approaches for cardiovascular disease, particularly in aging populations who have low LDL but continue to have vascular risks. Um, so those are the two areas I think that this is open up for us to consider. So we had proposed a general paradigm of atheroncology, which, which this paper just came out actually a few days ago. Um, and the idea is, is that in smooth muscle cells, we've shown that there is this tumor-like behavior and that it is modulatable and it is potentially a target for mechanistic therapeutic developments. We know this is true already from clonal myopoiesis, from myeloid and blood-derived cells, behavior accelerating atherosclerosis. We don't know if it's true for T cells. We don't know if it's true for adventitial cells and fibroblasts, which I think is in a very exciting area to think about. Fibroblasts are understudied in atherosclerosis, but they form a cap also. Um, so getting back to my perspectives in the beginning, um, I do propose that residual cardiovascular risk uh, in patients who are on LDL-lowering therapies and have met their goals still remains a major cause of death and disability over the lifespan of a patient. Um, there's unmet clinical need there. Genetic studies have given us a very large playground, but it's been hard to focus on that playground, what it means. But we can kind of use informatic approaches and large-scale approaches to keep narrowing down on particular hypotheses like smooth muscle cells. Causal genes and mechanisms remain undetermined for most of these genetic discoveries. So understanding the mechanism, understanding causality, and understanding directionality, like we're trying to do with the Pakistani studies. So in humans, if a heterozygous loss of function or a homozygous loss of function is associated with less vascular events, it suggests a therapy that would block that protein gene will have therapeutic benefit potentially. If there's safety issues, we should know that also with those types of studies and knockouts in humans. And that complements mouse knockout studies and cell biology studies. Um, we think that smooth muscle cells, that smooth muscle cells are underexplored for the genes that are causal in the disease, and that smooth muscle cell and smooth muscle derived cells are probably mediators, causal mediators of plaque stability, which is something that is still a big issue after LDL lowering. Um, and then the last is that this concept of atheroncology, I think, opens up some new ideas for therapeutic thinking and mechanistic thinking in atherosclerotic cardiovascular diseases. So I just finish up by acknowledging my group and my collaborators and colleagues in particular, uh, called out Hui Japan for his work in these several of these projects, but also Alex Bishore, who's actually starting working at Mount Sinai, I think next week or in two weeks time in the cardiovascular groups, um, has done a tremendous amount of work on single cell mouse and human and is very skilled in this area. And Tom Olson is a cardiology fellow who's <clears throat> worked on the human genetics with the Pakistani resources. Um, great collaborators, both nationally and internationally, peers and colleagues that I came up with through Penn, even in Ireland still that I worked with who I consider mentors and, and peer mentors. And then um, you know the funding sources that we couldn't do the work without, which, which is very exciting. At the bottom here is the CTSA Grant and Barry Collars here, and he understands and the UL ones switching to UM ones, which makes us crazy. But the bottom line is this is all really about the work in my lab group and, and our program on cardiology, not about the CTSA work. So I'll leave it at that. And um, again, thank you very much for, for your attention.
modified, or maybe there are that new obvious ones. <coughs> and you, you said earlier that just the uh, subsequent degrees in that person is high. What do you see as some thing we can do today <coughs> for that patient? Or can you give us a timeline about when we can target some of those key genes um, to really modulate the risk? Yeah, I'll put that into kind of three buckets. The first is that we do a lot already today. My practice is in preventive cardiology and clinics, so when we get someone who's a family history, you can layer on top of that um, where they seem to be at in the trajectory of disease through imaging and other markers. So yes, we do some human genetics, particularly around discovery in those patients. For anybody with extreme lipids, we're looking for diagnostics, right, and genetics for FH, et cetera. But you can decide based on the family history, that's increased risk, you know, the other risk factors, smokers, diabetes, but, but we use imaging. So coronary, cal coronary artery calcification, current CTAs, particularly coronary artery calcification. If you get a younger person in their 40s, 50s, 30s, 40s for men that has any coronary calcification, that is a big increase in their risk over a lifetime, over 10 years even. So we just become more aggressive. They become a disease equivalent. If they have a family history and coronary calcium above the 75th percentile, they should be treated like a patient who's had an event. And that's LDL levels that are hammered into the ground. And that's what you'll do, and you'll treat them very aggressively preventively. It sounds like the imaging could be sort of a point of, of treating too, right? So right. you have a low calcium score that's treating for them, and maybe their individual risk is <clears throat> The low calcium scores has been shown to have a very strong negative predictive value over 10 years, but it has to be done at a, the age of a little bit later on the average population. The second wave is, is just to think about, well, what could we do with things like clonal hematopoiesis? And, you know, there are groups that are taking patients who are already low in LDL, who've had events and repeated events, the profiling diagnostically have their clonal hematopoiesis, and it's not in the clinic yet, but then thinking about therapeutic interventions. We, we have trials that know, that tell us that blocking the inflammasome with IL-1 beta blockers reduce cardiovascular disease. We know that IL-1 beta inflammasome is activated in clonal hematopoiesis, particularly the JAK2B2 E2 mutations. Um, so we know we have therapeutics that could work there. So identifying the patients who have CHIP, who have the highest risk, perhaps, is where you do precision medicine with clonal hematopoiesis. And then the third is, how do we get to diagnose mutations in patients in the vessel wall that are not in the blood, right, in the cerebral muscle cells? And do we have a general paradigm shift to thinking about trials of certain types of drugs that might reduce atherol because of studies in mice or, and that tell us, well, look, this cancer drug is not increasing the risk, which a lot of them do. It's actually reducing the risk and then thinking about how to translate that. Yeah, and that's getting at this idea of um, the genes that are being expressed, they're not uniquely expressed in one cell or tissue. Platelets have played a pivotal role in, in atherosclerosis. ABO pointed us towards thrombosis in the presence of uh, atherosclerotic vascular disease, as well as the venous thrombosis side. And there were studies, case control studies on ABO going back to South Africa in the 1950s that showed that the ABO locus was associated with increased in MI, and it is genetically, and it's causal. It's probably got to do with glycoprotein modifications that are in the A and B groups that occur on the surface of platelets and the endothelium that increase adhesivity and volume and factor interactions, although the mechanisms are not fully worked out, and there's a lot of pleiotropy of different types of signals that could be involved. Um, in this case, you know, we don't see that mostly, we don't see that these genes are exclusively expressed in cerebral muscle cells, they're enriched. So we find that PD3A is in endothelial cell platelets. 
answer into the cells, and others are equally expressed in, in, in more than one cell type. Adam TS7 is endothelial cell, and smooth muscle cells, for example. Um, so I think it opens up cell-specific mechanisms and thoughts on how to target and what is the mechanism. And you, you, you're right in the sense that we really do have to consider the platelet, the endothelium, and the smooth muscle cell, probably as well as fibroblasts as we're thinking about the vessel wall, not just the immune cells, which are being recruited, T cells, macrophages, B cells, et cetera. Um, so, but it just brings back to the, the, the ideas of clonal expansion. So, you know, the, the work back in the 50s, 60s, pathologically suggested that there was clonal expansion in lesions and it was likely to be being, you know, the largest amount of clonal expansion was likely smooth muscle cell based based on kind of observational work, pathology work at that time. And that's been validated. What we don't know is, uh, is there other clonal expansions from using chymal cells that are in the adventitia, fibroblasts in the adventitia that migrate in is also. The endothelial cells can go through EMT and turn into fibroblast-like cells in the lesion as well. Gary Owens showed very nicely, very abnormal behavior for endothelial cells, but it does happen. And they probably have tumor-like behavior also, like they're expanding and proliferating. Can't directly comment. Um, I, I think that um, Sandra Jellick, who's, who's up at Columbia with me, I met first um, almost 20 years ago around sleep apnea and cardiovascular disease at an ATL Bay workshop. But she's now they just doing QA, yeah. Cell activation in, yeah, mm, you kind of lost. Sleep apnea and there's a nice program. Yeah, but, um, <laughs> yeah. He the kind of lost you with the smooth for, muscle. Um, abnormal. Bay, I'm said yes, so just reach out to her directly. Uh, and okay. something like obstructive sleep apnea or complex are obviously central. I'll I'll Actually, forward you her. Okay, yeah, she said yes. Sympathetic drive, and then there's um, peripheral in that there's uh, hypoxia and activation of immune processes that activate the endothelium. And how much is causal, you know, versus how much is, is you know, you're, you're getting two bad things happening at once. These patients have a lot of other risk factors going on. The interventions like like CPAP that, that, that reverse things, you know, it's really, it's really very interesting to work, to think about what are the positives and then some of the negatives that could be occurring on the vasculature, especially on microvasculature as well. But I don't have any direct observation here. I actually had a question about um, what you think uh, the key challenges are with regards to making treatment after a sclerosis more widely uh, personalized uh, with, with genomic information. And where, where do you think the genomic uh, personalized approaches will be? Yeah, so the first is germline, and then you're thinking of clinical diagnostics for extreme phenotypes or patients who have uh, very high cholesterol, FH, very abnormal triglycerides, uh, lipodystrophies where that gets into, you know, um, prediabetes and insulin resistance, uh, extreme hypertensions, and you're looking for secondary causes and occasionally you come up with genetics. So genetic profiling for rare disease phenotypes that affect atherosclerosis. And remember, FH is the commonest genetic disorder, Mendelian genetic disorder, it's completely treatable, and we under-test for it all the time, and we need to do the genetics for FH because LDL cholesterol does not capture it in younger populations necessarily at all, as shown by the Geisinger study, where a third of patients with FH did not have LDLs above the threshold in their 50,000 patients in the EHR record. So we really need to be doing better with our Mendelian disorder risks um, the second is polygenic risk scores. Again, germline polygenic risk scores. I think there is some utility for them. They're kind of an add-on. They're certainly probably better than CRP because they're capturing multiple pathways that are genetic and causal. Um, but it is to use a polygenic risk score for diabetes or cardiovascular disease or stroke that feeds in all of the GWAS findings. We don't know that they're all causal, but they're tying into pathways that relate to risk. And there's a number of studies, including the Emerge Consortium nationally, that are assessing polygenic risk scores, particularly in diverse populations, which have been understudied. Not all polygenic risk scores work in terms of prediction and future utility, but there's evidence that if used appropriately with the right genetic background information, you can do better in populations and thinking about risk. And third, then, is, is if there's somatic stuff going on, 
who should we be testing for it? And I believe this is where we should be, you know, kind of taking very young patients and saying, okay, there's nothing on their genetic Mendelian side, germline side, well, look, is there something going on here with a weird, wacky clonal metaboiesis or something else? And on the late stage, patients who have known vascular disease of recurrent events, their LDL is like 70 or what, you know, it's low, you know, should we be profiling a certain set of higher risk elderly patients for clonal metaboiesis and somatic mutations? And then we're thinking about how to bring in therapies to target them, like IL-1 beta and blockers for clonal metaboiesis, depending on the, depending on the mutation that occurs. Um, so I think we will go in that direction over time because we have not solved this problem of people dying from heart disease with LDLs of 70 and 80. That they're still dying from heart disease or vascular diseases, and that's a big unmet need. Now, some of it is complex complications, heart failure, phenotypes, and blah, 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 blah. But a lot of it is still events that are occurring in the vessel wall and uh, complex events and complex progression of peripheral vascular disease, coronary disease, and, and, and uh, cerebral vascular disease. And those you know, when you get to whatever age you might get to, you don't say, well, like, I don't deserve to have the most appropriate testing done for me. And the risk when your LDL is low and you've lived a life of risk, uh, stre of stress, uh, stress and risk factors, and your vessel wall has already undergone some somatic mutations, you probably need a different workup than we're currently doing for those patients to work out what's the big risk for you in the next 10 years. So I think there's a certain paradigm shift there to thinking about what does a patient need at a personal level who is at a certain point and already has low LDL cholesterol and good blood pressure, et cetera. Now, there's a lot of patients that don't have good blood pressure and cholesterol we still have to do a very good job on, um, but we do know that we're, we're missing something in the residual risk department. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. <laughs>